But those who don't know, don't worry, because uh, the coding, I'll try to keep it as easy as possible. Okay, The main thing is the concept of the game itself, the concept and how to get things working. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm done yep. talking. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, I think we can start now. Uh, so yeah, thanks for joining. Uh, I hope you're excited for Hack and Roll. This is probably the first event, event we have related to Hack and Roll at all. Yeah, and I was telling John that uh, we haven't had, NES Hackers, let alone Hack and Roll, has not had a game dev workshop for a long time. So super excited to see how it goes. I, I personally am, um, yeah. So yeah, a little bit more about John. He's from NES Games Dev Group. He's currently a PhD student. Uh, interested in research areas such as reinforcement learning and neural network complexity reduction. Sounds very complicated. But yeah, <laughs> he's, uh, he's also an avid game creator, which is why he's teaching this workshop. Uh, plugging his links, you can check out his itch.io link, uh, simmer.io link, and you can, he also streams game creation regularly, which is very, very cool. Uh, so if you want to follow him on Twitch, you can do that as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, so John, over to you. I think we can start. I'll stop sharing my screen. All By right. the way, uh, I hope everyone has received emails for the pre work for pre workshop instructions. If you haven't, there might be an issue with your email. So feel free to contact me on Discord. Yeah, uh, that's it. John, over to you. All right, I'll be sharing my screen now. So do let me know if you can see. It. Can can y'all see? It? Can y'all see my screen? Okay, so I'll be starting now. So, uh, uh, yes, sorry. Hello, um, is there uh, someone saying something? I can't really hear you, but uh, yeah, if, if there's anything, just, uh, just say again, okay? Uh, let me just begin the session. So um, today's workshop is an intro to game dev. It's a collaboration between NUS Games Development Club NUS GDG and NUS Hackers. So I'm from NUS GDG, and actually I teach also game development over there at the club itself. So we hope to um, basically give you all a taste of creating your first simple game on Unity Game Engine. Okay. So first, I will do some brief background slides on like the game development process and roles, and then after that, we'll go live to code together our bricks falling game. Okay. So first up. Okay, I think GDG, if you are interested to join, okay, you can just search our website. Okay, I'll put the link later. But basically, it's just a group of people who are interested to make games come together and then we create our games. Simple as that. Okay, no further uh, introductions needed. So this is the links. Okay, this is just some marketing. Okay, now we go straight to the workshop itself. All right. So game development. What exactly is um, game development? Okay, so... Anyone here uh, like to offer based in the chat? Uh, what do you think is game development? Like maybe we just pause for a while. You all just say your comments and then you know we can discuss about it. I mean, we all here have played games, but what do you think is involved in game development? Like what areas are involved? Anyone? Yes, okay, coding is one big part of uh, game development. Okay, thank you, uh, Mirudullah. Uh, anyone else? Understanding, yes, similar idea. Okay, other than programming, what else do you think is needed uh, to create a game? Yes, okay, UI. UI is one important thing because you know when you create games, your UI really, uh, it, it makes or breaks your game. Yeah. If your UI is not user-friendly, people will not want to play it. Um, say again. Sorry, you have to, for those who want to speak, you have to speak a little louder because I cannot really hear. It's a little muffled here. Okay, so, all right, I guess most of y'all have uh, talked about the coding part. Okay, actually there's way more than coding in game de development. Although today's workshop will mainly be focused on coding. Okay, so these are the few roles. Okay, game development basically is um, just trying to translate ideas you have in your head. Okay, like these sketches over here. Okay, and then you trade it into a live uh, animated game like Hollow Knight over here. 
Then over here, you also have like actions like you have this little creature jumping and jumping. It's something like Super Meat Ball, Super Meat Boy. Yeah. So this kind of things are basically people have things in their, in their minds that they want to bring to reality. And what better way to do it than through a game platform? Okay, because in a game, you can simulate almost anything you want. Okay. In fact, the metaverse, which is going to happen soon, will be a mega game. Okay. That will be uh, done in a game engine kind of manner, 3D. You can even immerse yourself fully. Okay. But today we won't, I, I, I don't have the skills to do that as well. That is really advanced technology. We'll be focusing mainly on simulating like 2D games with some motion in it. Okay. So what are the roles that uh, there are in game dev? Um, it's basically this field over here. So these you can read yourself. We'll be going through like a little bit into each of them. So what most of you have commented is the programming part, okay? But actually for game dev, there's a huge range of talents needed, okay? Because a great game won't be great if you don't have good music, you don't have good arts. Yeah, those kind of things makes or breaks your game as well. Yeah, like actually if you play a, a very nice action game, but the music is horrible, you probably wouldn't want to play it again because, you know, unless you play it in silent mode. Yeah, so, so all these different elements are very important to the, to the game creation process. So, okay, first is a strategist. Uh, this is actually my favorite because, you know, I do reinforcement learning kind of thing. I like to see how people, you know, react to different levels. So in my own games, I also ask my friends to play there, see whether it's too difficult. And actually most of my games, I toned down the AI difficulty by 50% after I release it because, you know, people don't like to keep losing. Yeah, so, so strategies, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to, AI is too good really. Yeah, if you really know how to code it, is is much very very challenging for a human to win the AI, yeah. So for like strategies, it's like how to introduce your levels. Like if you're doing Super Mario, you want to introduce your levels um in a sequential manner. You don't you don't want to overload the player with too much information. And like games like Super Mario, they actually do it very very cleverly because they actually do it in a left to right manner. And actually, there's no instructions at all telling you what to do. So you figure out the instructions along the way as they introduce more and more ob obstacles. So one uh, big part of game designing is creating the levels. Um, this is done by the level designer or strategist. Uh, next is the code wizard, which is probably most of us, okay? Since uh, most of you all like programming, almost half or more than half like it. So I believe we will fall mainly in this camp, okay? I myself is uh, in this camp. I'm, I do the game programming, okay? So um, we also do need a lot of people who know how to do art assets. So this art assets uh, basically uh, stuff like 2D pixel art or 3D blender art. All this is not easy to create, takes quite a lot of skill. And yeah, actually we have quite a big shortage of uh, artists. Like even in NUS GDG, um, the hardest role to fill up is the arts actually, because not everyone can draw quite well or draw or use these tools well. Okay. We have the audio engineer or the one creating music. So you use stuff like Concerto or Audible, you know, stuff, stuff like this to create your music. Okay. For me, uh, usually I just use uh, music that I take from royalty free sources. I don't do my own music, but uh, music is important for a game. Okay. We have this role uh, called the quality assurance. Okay. I guess it's the role that most of us uh, kind of like to do. Basically what they do is they play the games. And then they try every single possible manner to break the game. So usually this QA, they really try to make the programmer's job hard because they will find glitches, they find stuff to basically test the game and make sure that it's playable. Do those joining... Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Okay, so uh, lastly, we have this role called the producer. So the producer is basically someone like a leader in the group. So they actually lead, they plan the whole game dev process. They make sure timelines are met. They create the ideation and then tell everyone the vision of the game. So this is essentially the, the leader to make sure that the game is created. So if anyone in external um, parties have questions about the game, they actually go to the producer itself. So the producer needs to know what is going on, but need not do things at the micro level. Yeah, as you know, great leadership, you don't micro your team. Yeah, so producer is somewhat of that order. You need to know enough about what the game is, okay, but you shouldn't go too much into detail because then you will take away other people's rice bowls, the, the earlier people. Okay, 
Any questions so far based on the game rules? Okay, I hope you are excited about creating your first game in Unity. Okay, I will just pause here for any questions before I move on to today's highlights, which is the game creation session. Okay, I take it as everyone is all right. So today we will be doing a simple bricks game. So uh, this game actually is something that is very similar to stuff that I played. But I mean, it's the idea is that you are a little ball over here and then you need to avoid falling bricks. So the team is to survive as long as possible. You move your ball from left to right and the bricks will fall from above randomly. And you need to avoid hitting all these bricks. So this is a simple game to introduce you some colliders, some ideas about um, motion in a game. Okay, so let me just show you, okay, get you excited. I show you the finished product first before we start the, the game itself. Can you all see my Unity screen? Okay, so let me just show you how this game works, okay? So, I mean, over the weekend, I actually coded this like within one to two hours. So you are the li little ball, you move left to right, and the little bricks, uh, red bricks will be falling from above, and then you should try to avoid them as much as possible. So if you hit them, it's game over and it reloads. Okay, so it's actually quite tough. Yeah, I played this, I I die about 5,000 score. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, this is the idea of the game. Okay, so this will be what we will be creating today. Okay, so can I invite everyone? Okay, for those who have Unity installed. Okay, I would like you all to go to, let me just close these slides, okay? I would like y'all to, okay, for those who don't have, you can uh, download Unity here. You download to Unity Hub. And then from Unity Hub, okay, you can then install the Unity versions. Okay, so we'll be using like the latest version here, 2020.3.25F. If I use the earlier ones, it's fine. So yeah, there's not much difference. Okay, so what we will do now, okay, we will go to projects. Okay, for those who have Unity, you can follow me. Okay, go to projects. All right, then we create new project. And then we create a 2D game, okay? So over here, we can just call this game Bricks. Yeah, so let's do this. We create a new project. Okay, and, and it will take a while to load. Okay, so anyway, I would like to just check uh, who, who actually are the ones uh, who will be following me. So if you have downloaded Unity and are going through like step-by-step, can you raise your hand so that I'm aware of like who I need to wait for at each step? Okay, can anyone? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, quite a number of you, six of you. One, many. Okay, so I will expect to see like about six hands every time I ask whether you are ready to move on to the next step, okay? So I take it about six of you here uh, have Unity installed, okay? So now uh, we should have this simple game interface loaded, okay? So for, for those of you who like want to join in later and download, yeah, sure, you can download now. It takes about half an hour to install, okay? But meanwhile, in order not to delay everyone, okay, I will be doing some basic introduction about this Unity screen itself. So I'll do the introduction first. Oops, what did I do? <laughs> oh no, I quit. Okay, let, let me re-download, reopen my project. I, I didn't know what I did. I pressed a mouse button and Unity just uh, quit by itself. All right. Ah, there we go. Yep. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened, but Unity just like destroyed itself somehow. Okay, so we have bricks open. This is my project. Sorry for the technical glitch. Let me open bricks again. Okay, so you should create a new 2D game called bricks. Okay, you open it up and then you will see an editor here. So this editor will be where you create your games. Okay, so over here, let's, let's do a brief introduction of the editor. Okay, so on the left here, you have a hierarchy. So in a hierarchy, you have the scene, you have the camera, you have all the game objects that you create in Unity. 
okay, where you can drag and drop the objects, you can scale them, you can zoom in, zoom out. This will be where the action happens, okay? You will put on, so it's like taking, you know, a theater. You are a theater now, you have a cameraman. Now you put in your actors one by one. All this can be arranged in the hierarchy. So hierarchy is basically the one that organizes your layout. <clears throat> you know, you have text, you overlay your text. You have characters, you, you do your different characters at different positions, all through the hierarchy. So <clears throat> over here, we have two other uh, tabs. One is the scene. The scene, you can zoom in and zoom out using like your mouse buttons. And then this will be, maybe I'll just create a, a sample object here, like so that you can see, like maybe I just create a circle. So you can see that like in the scene itself, we have like a circle here. So you can actually zoom in and zoom out. So this rectangle that you see over here, uh, by default, a scene comes with a main camera. The main camera is now taking control, uh, is now able to see this circle that I've just created. Okay. so. We have two modes. One mode in the scene is basically for us to you know, do the choreography, make sure that things are... I, um, can you ask you him? There was a slight lag. Which sample scene was it for project creation? Oh, sorry. I'm not, not sure what is uh, HDRP and URP. But um, the sample scene right now is basically the default scene when you, you, you open a new project, you will have this sample scene, which we can just rename it later. Yeah, we can rename it as game or something. Yeah. So yeah, over here you can like rename your scene. Yeah, so yeah, let me continue. So we have the scene here, which you can do your rearrangement of your objects like that, you see? We can have a circle inside here, mm -hmm. We can, uh, we can even have like, maybe you can create a new game object, a square, okay, all, all these later we'll be using. So I just show you some stuff first. So you can have all this, uh, and then you can like maybe color it differently over here. So this on the right here, the inspector is basically like the properties of all your objects. Like you can color the square yellow and stuff. And then this will appear on the game objects over here on the left, as you can see. So. This scene itself, you can configure your objects. And then if you want to see how a user would see your game, you go to game. Okay, this game tab here will show you how it looks like. So you can see over here, like this is the scene. Okay, I can even do it separately, like uh, side by side. You can see that this is where, this is what you control your objects in. This is like basically how you manipulate your objects and you can manipulate them in your scene. And this is how your game should look like on the, on the right here. So the game itself is basically the UI and people can use this UI to play your games. Okay, Inspector is really just um, the different kinds of attributes of the objects. Okay, for each object, there's always this uh, transform attribute. Okay, not okay, not always, some of them don't have, but most objects have this transform attribute, uh, which basically is controlling the position in the X, Y, and Z plane. Okay, some of you might think, you know, 2D game, how come got Z plane? Uh, it's actually possible because you can overlay some objects uh, in front of another. So if we toggle over here, this view here, 2D, you can see that Unity also exists in 3D view, okay? But over here, we can like do a two dub, um, hold two mouse buttons down to rotate. And then we can zoom, scroll up and down to zoom in or zoom out. So you can see that uh, if you look at a 2D game in a 3D perspective, you can see that the camera is here. Okay, let me just go to a bigger scene. You can see that the camera is here. And the camera is shining on. Okay, let me let me try to zoom towards the camera itself. So the camera is currently shining onto the plane. Okay, can you see that the camera is shining downwards? And then it's putting these two objects inside its view. And exactly, this is exactly what's happening. The main camera is on a Z axis of minus 10. And the objects are on Z axis of zero. So essentially a 2D game. It's really still a 3D game. Just that we project everything onto a 2D surface so that you can view the game in 2D, okay? So let's go back to 2D mode here. Okay, we don't need a 3D mode for this game. Okay, I'm just introducing you some features of uh, what Unity has. Okay, in the game itself, okay, you can see that we can also control the aspect of the game here. Like for those kind of WebGL builds, or uh, basically if you want to upload as a HTML game, usually it's a 960 pixels by 600 pixels. So you can change your dimensions here. 
and your camera here will change accordingly. Okay, there are different pixels that you can experiment. Like 19201080 is a Samsung phone. So, you know, you can create games for phone as well. So Unity is great because you can use one uh, single code. You can create a game for phone, for WebGL, for Windows and Mac, all in one code. You don't need to learn like different languages like Swift and uh, like all, all the other like uh, Mac OS X languages to create different games. Okay, uh, Uwu asks, where do you see the minus 10? Okay, so uh, if you click on the main camera in your hierarchy, okay, on the right in the inspector itself, you will see this position here, X, Y, and Z. So Z means that the camera, instead of being on the base plane of Z equals zero, is on a plane of Z equals to minus 10. And all the objects are at Z equals zero when you create them. So the camera is essentially projecting onto your objects from far. Yeah, uh, this is just a high level perspective of how this 2D game works. Okay, um, for the game creation today, we don't have to touch the Z axis at all. Okay, we just need to know what's the X and Y axis. So X is basically um, from left to right. The Y axis is from top to bottom. Okay, so we can see this over here. Like if we go to the circle, let's put Z and X and Y to be zero. If my X is like five, it's on the right. If my X is minus five, it's on the left. If my y is minus five, it's at the bottom. If my y is five, it's at the top. So it's x and y like that, okay? And then we have uh, stuff like rotation. You rotate in the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. We have scale. So you scale, you can scale the circle in the x-axis, y-axis, and so on. So these are different things you can do to configure your objects. Okay, so, okay, don't worry about all these objects, okay? I'm, I don't need y'all to create them. I'm just using them as example to demonstrate how to use this uh, editor. Okay, so also at the top here, you will see uh, a few tools, like the hand tool. The hand tool, you can use it to like drag the, the scene. Okay, you have the move tool, which is basically to move an object. Okay, just now you see that yeah, you can move an object like that. We have the rotate tool to rotate the object. You can also do it through the stuff on the right here. Okay, you have a rotate tool. Let me un undo this. You have a scale tool, which you can use to scale the object up and down. Yeah, so this, these are different tools you can use. You have the rect tool, which will do in the rectangle form like this. It's like dragging and opening a window, you know? This is the rect tool. This is my favorite tool because I use it more often than all the other tools. The most useful. We have this uh, mega move, rotate or scale. I don't like this because if you <laughs> if you do this, sometimes you you move, you rotate wrongly. It's, it's a bit hard to click on it, but it, it does exactly like what all the above few buttons do. Just that it's a mega button. You can do all in one, but you must click the right areas. Okay, and then finally, we have the, okay, this editor too, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, we it's, it's not part of the basic ones. And basically for those who have uh, Unity itself, okay, you will realize that you can also access all these tools instead of clicking on the top button, which will be a little slow sometimes. You can actually use the, the keys called Q, W, E, R, T, Y. So these are shortcuts. Q is the move tool. W is the, sorry, Q is the grabber where you can just grab your scene and move. Okay, W is the move your object up and down. E is the rotate. R is the scale. T is the rectangle. And then Y is this mega everything in one tool. So QWERTY, remember QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. This corresponds to one of the six options that you have at the top here. Okay, so I go on to the bottom. Okay, now we, we go to the bottom. So at the bottom here under project itself, you will see this is where you, your folder of where you save all your files in. Okay, we have this thing called scenes. Okay, which at the moment you have the main scene. Okay, over here it should be sample scene, but if you just click on the name here, you can change it to like game. Okay, uh, we can still stick to sample scene. I mean, no, no difference. Okay, what I want, um, okay, let, let me just pause here for a while. Can I just check with those uh, people who have installed Unity, uh, the six of you? Uh, are you all able to load a new 2D project? If you have, can you put your hands up so that I know that I can move on? Okay, so three, four, five. Okay, all of you are great. Okay, that's good. You know, if more, if, oh, I see a seven hand. Okay, 
yeah, maybe to help me, um, could you like help to maybe put a, a asterisk on the left of your name, like like a star? Let me let me just show you how to do it. Yeah, like you if you look at my name, I put a star at the left. Okay, so I know that like um you are the ones that are following along. So I can I, I can paste along with you all. Okay, so those who have Unity installed, put a star beside on the left of your name. Okay, so great. I see most of you have already the stuff. Who is called dot and dot dot? <laughs> it's <a> anonymous. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, now let us do something. Okay, I need you to do your first task. Okay, so in your assets down here. Okay, because later for the um, game, for the balls and the bricks falling, I will need two additional folders. Can we create them now? So you right click here, create folder. Okay, and one folder that we will put is the scripts folder. Okay, the scripts folder is basically the folder where we store our C sharp scripts later. Okay, and I will also need you to create a new folder. Okay, this next folder is called prefabs. Okay, what are prefabs? Later I will tell you. Uh, yes, Ray, the Zoom will be recorded. Okay, by uh, the hacker site, and then we'll be Chaitanya will be uploading on the YouTube. I believe. So create two folders. Okay, in most games, uh, like I've created or I work with other people, there are other folders that you need to create, such as music, art assets, uh, this kind of folders where you store your images and everything. You can create this. Just think of this like a workflow organizer. You want to organize different things there. So you create different folders for your needs. Okay, so let me just uh, do something now, okay. Uh, earlier I created the, the surface and square, but I didn't tell you all how to create. So let, let, let me restart this part. Okay. I, I just delete everything. Okay, go to your uh, hierarchy itself. Okay, and then under game, you right click game object. So everything in Unity is a game object. Okay, because everything can be controlled using the parent class game object. So one object that we'll be creating first, we'll be creating our 2D object sprites circle. Okay, because I'm a little uh, lazy to show you how to download assets online and, and drag, drag it in. Actually, it's quite simple. It's just drag the assets into the folder here. So we'll just be using the inbuilt 2D sprite for our game today. So the 2D sprite is a circle. So you can see that this is the circle right now. Okay, there's a camera sign over here, okay, which uh, is kind of blocking my circle. So you have to see that this white circle is here. So I want you to create right click and add a new game object circle. Okay, so I'll pause here until you are done creating this game object for yourself. Okay, so um, just raise your hand after you're done creating this uh, game object, which is a circle. Okay, uh, see one hand. Okay, so uh, let me just repeat the procedure again. You go to game, right click, game object, 2D object, sprites, circle. You click that one and then you will see a circle appearing. Okay, so we will be able to create a game object that we can control, okay? A circle right now. Okay, are you able to create it? Okay, I see about two hands. Uh, the rest, are you all having any issues? I should have six of you all who are following. So about half. Yeah, uh, I, I'll, I'll wait for you all a bit because I don't want to rush through this. Um, are you all able to follow so far? Okay, we have four now. We have four. Uh, two more to go. Yeah, create a circle game object. So that's the first task. Okay, right click game object, two D object sprites circle. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's about five. I think that's majority. Okay, I will move on. Okay, so this circle will be the player that will be controlling later. So what I need to do now is, okay, you see 
um, in the sample game that I created, there, were, there are some walls at the top left, right, and bottom. Okay, I need y'all to like sort of create that. Okay, so in order to do it, one thing that we need to do is we need to right click game object, 2D object, sprites, square. Okay, you can create a square. Okay, we rename this square called the wall. We, we call this the wall. All right. So one way we can do it is we can click on the wall itself, press the W button, press the W button, or you can go to the move button. You move this wall all the way to the bottom like that. Okay, press the T button and then you can like shift your, so this will be the wall itself where your ball will fall on, okay? So uh, let's color this, wall here, yellow, like that. I mean, you can color it any color. You can go to color here and color it yellow. So over here on the color, let me just introduce you. Um, Unity uses this uh, color 32 system, okay, where actually it's essentially an RGB system. So in color 32 um, object, there's a red value, which varies from zero to 255, green value, which varies from zero to 255, and a blue value. And there's an A value also. Anyone want to guess what does A represent? So like a color 32 takes in four values, R, G, B, and A. Anyone want to guess uh, what, what is A? Alpha, yes, correct. Uh, that's the transparency. So if we set the alpha to be like zero, you will see nothing. And this is a very good way to like make objects fade in and fade out in Unity. Okay, so um, you can control the color. It's an object property under this class called Sprite Renderer. Okay, so we create a yellow color wall like that. Okay, I will just pause here. And basically, after you create the yellow color wall, you will see something like this a circle with a yellow wall at the bottom. Well, I mean, we can call it the floor also, but uh, we'll be duplicating it that to do the left, right, and the top walls. Okay, so any issues so far with the wall? Okay, so I mean, if you are interested to see the wall, I mean, the position is at zero minus four. Uh, the scale is maybe, let me, let me just toggle the scale a bit. One and 20 maybe, yeah. So if you want to like, just use the transform to change your scale, you can just use these values. Zero minus four, zero, zero, 21. So this should be how it looks like in the game itself. Okay, and based on uh, what I coded, uh, before the circle should be like about half the size okay, so that it's easier to, to play the game yeah so uh, do these two changes and then uh, just raise your hand when you are ready to move on to the next step so we create a circle and then we create a wall at the bottom okay you use the properties that i've uh, introduced earlier to either use the tools at the top left here okay or you use the transform at the right over here to change your uh, game object they have created. Okay. All right. Uh, three of y'all have raised your hands. Okay. I'll wait a little bit more. Yeah, we, we have like four or five hands before I move on. Okay. We're great. We have our fourth hand. Okay. Very good. So um, we have already created our circle and our wall here. Okay. Right now, yeah, I'm going to introduce you something. Okay. I'm going to introduce you this concept of gravity. Okay, so you know uh, when God created the world, He said, "Let there be gravity." Uh, actually, He didn't say that, but now imagine you are in this world here with this. Okay, so if we were to play this game world right now, you will see that the ball is stationary; it's not moving. It's like stuck. You see, it's stuck there. Okay, I want my ball to drop down. Okay, but I cannot um do the dropping like I can do it by code, but I want to use the physics engine to do the dropping down of the ball for me. That's why we use Unity, right? If not, we could do this game on a PowerPoint, on a PowerPoint document <laughs> or PowerPoint, or you can also use like maybe Python to code some uh, similar game like this. But we are using Unity. So Unity has this thing called the physics engine, which will help you simulate um, effects of uh, gravity or forces on your objects. And that is what we will be using today. So I would like to introduce you to this thing called components. So you know, it's like, you know the modularity system? 
Like for example, your phone, you want some certain apps, you download this, download that, download this. Yeah. So you can also like put in different different classes onto your game object. And how you do this is you add a component. So the first component that we'll be adding is the rigid body 2D. So you type in rigid body 2D and you see over here appears. Click on rigid body 2D. Okay, so my circle will have a rigid body 2D now. Okay. So this circle has a rigid body 2D and the body type is called dynamic. Okay, so there's a three body types here. Let me just tell you all what roughly each of them means. Static means it will not interact with any force. It will just be stationary there. Maybe it's like a, 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 a bottom floor or something like that, that that doesn't interact with any object. You can use static. Okay, I rarely use it. Usually you use either kinematic or dynamic. So dynamic has gravity acting on you. Okay, kinematic doesn't. Okay, kinematic is just uh, when you have other objects that bump into you, then it will it will basically uh, move. So if you want to have things like other objects hit you and then you move, you need to set full kinematic collision, like kinematic, kinematic. Okay, but uh, for the purposes of today, okay, everything will be dynamic. Okay, dynamic means that you have gravity acting on you. You can you can bump into other objects with rigid bodies on them. And then the physics system will calculate uh, what's the force, the resultant force, and update the position of these objects. So we add in a rigid body 2D to our ball. Okay. So you add in this component. Okay. And then we click play and then we see what happens. Okay. Look. Oh, it fell through the, the, the wall. Okay. Uh, that's also because, okay. A rigid body itself okay, is it's not uh it's not enough only on the circle. You also need it on the wall itself. You need the rigid body component here as well. So let's add in a rigid body component for the wall. So over here the body type is dynamic. Do you think this is correct? Let's try. Okay, let's try. Okay, we do both dynamic circle and wall like that. Okay, and then we see what happens. Oh, both of them fell down at the same time. <laughs> so, so we what we really want is we want the uh, circle to fall down and land on the ground itself. Okay, it means that you can think about this. Okay, so the body type, maybe we should use static for the walls, you know, so that you won't you won't fall down. So let's try. We do a static type for walls. Okay, and then we see what happens. Okay, let's press the play button after we set the rigid body to be static for the wall at the bottom. Oh, it still fell through. Okay, why? Okay, why? Because a rigid body itself, okay, it's actually not sufficient to do the physics collisions. Okay, the rigid body uh, helps to add forces to the object itself. But to do a full flash collision, I need you to add one more component to it. Okay, I need you to add one more component, which is a collider. Well, you can think of colliders as like uh, areas that you add to the object such that if anything falls into that uh, region of the collider, certain scripts can be triggered. Like for example, the rigid body. So over here, we can add a box collider 2D. Sorry, circle is a circle collider 2D. We can add a circle collider 2D to our circle. Okay, so if you click on this circle collider, okay, uh, we go back to see, you, if you click on the circle collider, you see that we can actually edit the size of the collider. So the collider can be actually bigger than the circle itself. Okay, but over here, we just want the collide, collider to wrap closely to the circle. So we add a circle collider 2D to the circle. And we go back to the wall. For the wall itself, let's add a box collider 2D. And the box collider 2D, you can see if you click on edit collider, you see that it's wrapping very nicely along the wall itself. Okay. So now that we add in both the circle collider and the uh, box collider, let's try running the code again in the game itself to see whether we can get the uh, effects of the ball dropping down on the floor. Okay, let's see. Oh, there we have it. All right, everyone give, okay, uh, before we give ourselves a round of applause for achieving this remarkable feat in Unity, I'd like to see whether you can do it. Okay, so uh, do a thumbs up or raise your hand if you have successfully gotten your wall to stay stationary and the ball to drop down on your wall itself. So, uh, the Mr. Dot has uh, achieved it. Okay, first to achieve it. Congratulations. 
Okay, so for those who are still trying to achieve it, let me just recap the steps again, okay? It's very important that you understand uh, what's going on here. So on the circle object, we add in the rigid body 2D component, which allows forces to be manipulated on the object. Okay, but for object to object interaction, okay, we will need a collider, okay? So we need usually the rigid body and the collider comes hand in hand. So the rigid body will control the forces acting on the object and the collider will determine which area of the object will get the, uh, will, will get the impacts. You know, like if you are playing those shooter games like uh, Toho, Toho shooter, you don't want the collider object to envelop the entire ship, right? Because any bullet grazed through the ship will get destroyed. So usually the hitbox is all the way at the center of the ship. Let's say the ship is here. The hitbox is one tiny dot in the center. So all this can be done using the colliders, like the hitbox for your, for your ships. So circle collider for the circle. For the wall, we have a rigid body, which is static. And then we have a box collider 2D attached to it. Okay. So anyone can tell me why we use static instead of dynamic for the, for the wall? You all remember? Why do we not want to use dynamic, but why static for the wall itself? Yeah, anyone uh, who has been following, you can answer. This just uh, to check whether you understand. So why can't we use dynamic for the rigid body for the wall? Yes, because we don't want the wall to drop down, correct? <laughs> so there's also another way to, to make the wall uh, not drop down and use uh, dynamic, okay? Anyone want to guess? How do you make the wall not drop down, but use a dynamic rigid body? The answer has to do with manipulating one of these four values here. Okay, so um, gravity scale to zero. Okay, let's try it. Let's try this suggestion. So we go dynamic, we set gravity scale to zero. Let's see whether the wall falls down. Let's see. Oh, not bad. The wall didn't fall down, okay? But after uh, it received the collision, the force of this ball hitting the wall actually cause the wall to drop down further. Okay, so uh, actually, yes, uh, the answer is gravity scale is zero. But in this special case, because we have another object uh, doing the collision, okay, we cannot use dynamic because uh, we will definitely be affected by the wall dropping on the ground, that force dropping on it. You know, if you use physics, action equals reaction, right? So you hit both will, both will move apart, right? So. Um, in this case, uh, we have to use static, okay? So just to let you know, but, but the idea is that if you don't want an object to fall down and you want it to give it a kinematic rigid body, or sorry, a dynamic rigid body, you set your gravity scale to zero. Okay, and this gravity scale is actually quite cool. Right? You can use this in your games. Like, for example, if you want to simulate a, a ball jumping on the moon, your gravity scale can be 0 0.01. Then you will see the ball jump very high. Uh, but if it's on like Mars or Jupiter, you can set your gravity scale to five and it will drop very fast. So let the physics engine do the um, acceleration, you know, half MV squared, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's rigid body 2D. Yeah, let me look at the questions one by one. Is there a way to set the coefficient of restitution, like make the ball bounce or making collisions elastic? Uh, yes, uh, there's a way to do that. Okay, but that is under materials. So you have to set your own physics 2D materials, okay? And then like, let's say if I were to create a new 2D material, create a physics, okay. I can't remember how to do the materials, but there's a way to create a physics material. 2D physics. Yeah, you can create a physics material here and you, you go over here, you can see that you have a friction and bounciness component here. So if you want the, the ball to like bounce, you can set a bounciness to one. Okay, and then you just drag this physics component down here to your material here. Yeah, so like once we, we drop on the wall itself, you see, pointing it, pointing it, you can, you can set physics materials here. So, you know, if you play games like uh, Portal, you know, you walk over those like slippery, I don't know if you played Portal, but I mean games like that, where you have rough terrain or you have like slippery liquid that you can use to dash and stuff. All these are done using physics materials. Like you set friction to zero, you will fly like, you will fly without stopping because like there's no friction to stop you back. So you can add in this material. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so for this right now, we don't really want it to bounce so much. So we just put maybe bounciness to zero. I'm glad you asked all this because um, this will demonstrate uh, what Unity 
can actually do for you in terms of this physics. So over here, you see, I set my bounciness to zero. Look, look at what happened to the ball. It's, not, it's something like, you know, your golf ball goes inside some, some dirt pitch. Goes in there, cannot come out anymore. All right. So I hope that answered that question, uh, Pranaya. Okay, U asks, uh, does the rigid body 2D take into account normal contact force friction or only gravity, like where you make the ball bounce up? I think that question is similar. Uh, yes, it takes into account everything, the gravity and the, and the contact force itself. Uh, but whether the ball, ball bounces back up, it really depends on the mass and also like how much friction is lost upon contact, which is de de determined by the physics material. So um, there's quite a lot of factors involved in making the object move and react with each other, but we don't have to go into any of the math inside there. Okay, that's the reason why we use Unity. Okay, leave the math behind. Okay, leave the math to Unity and just focus on the effects. Okay, just change the physics material and then you, know, you get different effects. So I hope everyone has, uh, is able to create a ball going down, okay, onto the wall like that. Okay, all good, right? All good. Okay, now I've, I'm gonna tell you all something uh, interesting, okay? Yeah, have you ever done stuff like, you know, uh, create the same like piece of code or same, same chunk of code and retyping it again and again and again and again? Yeah, so in, in order to prevent, okay, imagine let's say I ask you to create hundreds of these circles, okay? And then suddenly your manager or your director tells you, hey, actually your circles are too small. Why don't you make them twice the size? Then you need to go through hundreds of your circles and then you know you need to duplicate the size by two for each of the circles again and again. Okay, that, that kind of sucks, right? Yeah, so in order to avoid you doing like repetitive work, okay, like for example, your wall, let's say you, you want to change your box collider, you want to change your, your rigid body, Let's say you don't want to, to do that, like for each of the walls, okay? This is uh, the way of doing this in Unity. It's called prefabs, okay? I'm going to show you a two-second demonstration of how to create a prefab. Are you all ready? Okay, and one, two. Okay, done. That's it. <laughs> we have created a prefab. So in order to create a prefab or like a template, all you need to do is drag the game object into any folder. You don't even need to call the folder prefabs. Just drag the game object to any folder. Okay, in this case, I call it prefabs. And then over here, you can see that this is the main object that we can manipulate. Okay, we can manipulate this game object. And then let's say over here, I change my color to green. Okay. And then uh, automatically, every single thing that is a prefab here will have the color green. So you change one, change all. Okay. Okay, now, this is an interesting thing. If we were to create three walls, I just did a control D here, so I like duplicated the wall. So uh, I'm gonna shift the wall to, I'm gonna shift uh, this other wall up here. So if we were to create three walls like that, okay? And let's say if I were to change the attribute of one of my uh, prefab, uh, this called, uh, I can't remember the technical name for it, but this is called uh, like, descendants of the prefab. Like you have a parent, which is the template, and then you have your descendants over here. But sometimes your descendants are not exactly like fully the same. Okay. Maybe over here, I, I want this color to be like orange. And I want this color over here. Okay, I, I still set this color to be green, okay? So if I were to change one of my uh, descendants of the prefab to a different attribute, when I change the attribute of the main prefab itself, okay, you can see that Okay, let, let me just change this back to yellow. You can see that the top and the bottom has changed back to yellow, right? After I changed the, the parent prefab to yellow, you can see the top and bottom has changed back to yellow, but the middle did not. Okay, why? That's because I have changed the color attribute already for the descendants. So basically, um, you can just keep this in mind for the descendants of your prefab, or basically you just replicate the, the, main, the prefab from the parent itself. Any attribute that you change here, is permanent, okay? So when you change your prefab and then um, Unity realizes that your attribute here is different from the attribute of your parent, it won't change the attribute, okay? This applies for size, for position, for color, and, and so on. So just bear this in mind. 
Okay, right now, what I want you to do, okay, challenge yourself. Okay, I want you to, to do this. Okay, we have a prefab of a wall, okay? But uh, we want to make sure that the user cannot escape the screen, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to envelope the wall on all four directions. So to do that, you need to create four walls. I'll show you how to do the top wall. It's like that. Yeah, you just drag it to the top. But for the side walls here, is either you do a rotation or you do a something like that. Yeah, so I want you to create the four walls to the left, right, up and down, okay, off your screen. So how it should look like at the end, it should look like this. Yeah, you realize how I'm setting a bigger area here, the left and right? That's because uh, actually in the physics engine, you can have some clipping sometimes, like after the frame update, okay, I'll be going through how Unity does the frame updates later, but there, there could be an instance where you click through the wall. So you don't want that to happen. You want the ball to be like still in place within the screen. So you set like a, a larger area for collisions. So this is how it should look like at the end after you do all four walls. Something like that. So I think the wall at the bottom is quite ugly. So let's change this. Yeah, so use your prefab, okay? Duplicate your walls itself. And then this is how uh, the game should look like after you, you added the wall at the left, right, and the top. Okay, it's still quite ugly at the side here. So let me just make sure that this... Yeah, I really like Unity a lot because I've actually done, experimented, like using <laughs> creating games on uh, Android platform, like the, the Android SDK directly, and Android Studio basically. And it, it was a nightmare to create like even scaling dimensions and everything. Unity does this all like quite automatically for you, uh, no matter like how you scale your stuff. Yeah, uh, you there's way, there's ways to 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 do like different scalings. I, I quite like Unity a lot for that. So, yeah, just just sharing <laughs> some of my preferences. So yeah, I, I really like Unity a lot. Yeah, I don't really like Android Studio. Yeah. So, okay, and anyway, back to back back to the game development itself. Uh, I need y'all to create these four walls. Okay, so after you're done, just do a, a raise your hand after you're done creating these four walls. Okay, so what we should have right now, we should have a ball being able to drop down with gravity like that to the bottom uh, wall itself. And we should have all four sides of the wall like that. Okay, so I'll just uh, wait for y'all to finish this. Okay, so far no hands raised yet. Okay, one hand, two hands, three hands. Okay, I'll wait a bit more. Uh, okay, four, very good. i go by majority, you know, more than, more than half. Okay, then it's okay. Okay, so now I hope you are ready for some typing. Okay, because we need to do some scripting right now. Okay, so scripting is a term used to say using C sharp to control the behaviors of certain objects in the game. And, and that is required in certain games where you want to do things beyond what is the functionalities of the given uh, like given attributes or different programs that you can download to your different objects. So all these are like different programs. Actually, all these are classes, like this is a sprite renderer class, rigid body class, box collider class. So what if we want to do a certain attribute, such as moving the ball left to right or giving it a little jump? Okay, today we'll just be doing left to right. Okay, the jump part, I think um, maybe if you're interested, you can watch the your YouTube video. But I think um, let's do left and right, okay? Because I don't want to go too much into different areas. We want to get the core functionality out. So we are going to create a game, a, a script to our ball, our circle, that allows us to control it left and right. Okay, that's what we're going to do here. So over here, I need you to go to your scripts. Okay, are you able to go to your scripts folder? Okay, you can also do it in any folder actually, but, but because we want to be organized, we do it in the scripts folder. Okay, go to the scripts folder, uh, right click, create, C sharp script. Can you see this? Right click, create, C sharp script. Okay, click, click on it. <laughs> and then we call it like 
that's quite player. Okay, because this will control the actions of this player itself, which is the ball. So let me just uh, double click on player itself. Oh, actually, I forgot to tell you something. Uh, you need actually an IDE for your scripting as well. Like over here, I'm using a Visual, Base, a Visual Studio Code. So if you don't have any IDE where you do this programming, okay, uh, you probably need to use stuff like Notepad or TextPad and do this code. Okay, but I will just safely assume that since most of you are well-versed in programming, I just assume you have an IDE, right? <laughs> so, okay, if you don't have an IDE, no worries. You can still edit it using text edit, notepad, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's, let's, let's go to this code. So I have something to introduce here. Okay, how Unity does its uh, frame update. Okay, it is quite unique, okay? So there's a few, there's a whole flow chart for that. Okay, I'm not going to show the entire flow chart. I'm just going to show you what is important. So there's a method called awake. Okay. So every game object, or rather every class, okay, as long as you have, you have this awake function, Unity will go through every single class that you have in your hierarchy, look at this awake function, and execute this code for all the objects one by one. Uh, there are ways to customize whose awake comes first and stuff like that. But those are very advanced. Okay, we don't have to use all this. Usually what you do is like awake is used to find uh find references to different game objects in your scene and then like start, you use it to initialize it. Okay, so awake will be executed first, then starts, and then updates will be called every single frame to update like the game object's position, game's object's color, game object's attribute. You can you can put anything in this update. So the flow is awake, start, updates. And guess what? That's also a late update. <laughs> so so uh, there are different ways to like control the behavior of your object. So they go through one by one, awake, start, update, late update. For physics, there's also fixed update. Okay, uh, but all this, uh, let's not go too much in detail. Okay, uh, I'm just telling you more so that you know the, the flow of the uh, function calls that Unity makes. So Unity will go through all the game objects in your hierarchy over here, okay? And then it will call all the awakes one by one in a particular order. You can also switch the order of um, which object calls first, okay, but that one is a little more complicated. But uh, all you need to do is like, if you want some things to be executed first, put them in awake. Okay, then they will go through the game objects again, again and go through the start function and then they'll call one by one. Then they'll go at each frame. Okay, so the game is made out of multiple frames. At each frame, the update function will be called, and then you can do some update to it. You should then update your object itself. Okay, so enough about all this. Let's start coding, okay? Let's start coding. So what, we, what do we want to do? We want to make the ball move left and right, right? So there's one very uh, useful function that we can get. Okay, so it's called input.getAxis horizontal. Okay, so this essentially will take a look at the keys that you have set for the horizontal movement. Okay, and actually the horizontal movement keys, I believe, are under project settings, edit project settings. Okay, and then under input manager, you can set like your horizontal keys here. So over here is left and right or A and D. Okay, so you know, like if you play those retro games, you can set your left, right key, up, down key, you can set your fire key and so on. You can do it all over here under axis, horizontal, vertical, fire one, fire two, fire three, jump, mouse, X, mouse, Y. Does this remind you of those arcade games? Yeah, so essentially you can actually use all this, set your default key and so on. And then you can use Unity's input manager to get any inputs from these keys. Okay, so this is the input manager. And what we want to do is, we get the axis horizontal, which will scan what is the left or right key. If the user press a right, it will be towards the plus one side. If it's uh, on the left, it will be minus one. And then um, the, the exact value of this plus one or minus one would be dependent on, let me just show you input. Dot. Yeah, so basically it will be in the range of minus one to one, okay? 
Um, so over here, like let's say we want to get the horizontal axis, we just need to do input.get axis. And then based on how long you press your arrow button, the Unity editor will give you a value between minus one and one for this. So this is basically input.get axis. Yeah, so all the functions that we use over here can be under uh, found under Unity documentation. So input.get axis is one of them. Okay, so let's go back to our script. We have input.get axis horizontal. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to do like maybe a float. The a float data type is decimal place. Okay, for those who know programming. So a float, uh, let's call it x, x update equals to input dot get axis horizontal times okay what what do you want to multiply we want to multiply by the players we want to multiply by a speed okay which we will set later and then time dot delta time okay I'll, I'll step through what each of these means okay uh but before that can i just check whether you are able to see my code can you see my code here on the screen okay all good all right so we have something like this. Okay, so there are stuff like this. Uh, so this one, you know, it gives you a value between minus one to one. This player speed here, okay, will be, okay, this is where I, I, uh, I will show you how I normally do this coding. Okay, so I will set uh, public variables and a private variables here. So for those who know like those kind of object-oriented programming, public variables in your class means that other people can access those variables from another class and modify them. But private variables to this particular class player means it's inbuilt native to that player object itself. And other scripts outside cannot modify them. Okay, so there's public and private. Okay, there's also protected. Okay, but all this, you just need to know public and private. These are the main things. Public means everyone can edit. Private means only from within the class you can edit it. So over here we have this player speed here. Okay, so player speed by right, it should be a public variable. We can call it a float player speed. Okay, maybe we call it five. Okay, F means float. Okay, so in, we set the player speed in five. Time dot delta time is basically or gives you the time elapsed. Okay, I believe it's in microseconds. I can't remember. Or in seconds, time elapsed in seconds since the last frame update. So this is time dot delta time. So with this, we can get like how much to move in the x-axis based on how much input you get, based on the player speed variable you give to your ball, and then based on the last time elapsed, how much uh, of an x-axis change I need to have. Okay, so this is the x-update part here. Okay, I have something in the chat. Okay, yes, all right. So over here, we have a float player speed equals 5f. Okay, let's uh, do this here. Okay, and then after that, drag this thing into your circle itself okay so there's two ways to add in this script to your circle one is to drag the script directly into the game object itself another way is go to the game object okay under the under the game object here you click on add component and then you can add scripts like you can add the player script here directly so there are, there are two ways to add it one is one is using drag and drop method and one is you add the component here okay so i'm just going to show you how how this uh, look like after i okay actually you can't see it right now because i didn't do the, the transform.translate yet okay uh, let me just go back to my scripting okay there's something wrong here okay compile errors need to be fixed okay uh there's a semicolon expected yeah miss out a semicolon somewhere Line 21. I think it should be fine, actually. Uh, there shouldn't be an issue for this. For a minute, let me check. Okay, so now it's, it's, it's working already. Okay, I want you to use this script here. So we add in one line here, which basically edits the speed of the, edits the X update to change based on the input. 
And I need a second thing from you. Okay, I need a second thing. And this thing is to shift the ball by the X update over here. So how do we do this? We use this function called transform.translate. Okay, so you know every single game object has a certain transform here, which has a position where the game object is. So the transform.translate will basically update the position, okay, based on the direction of translation, like where you want it to go. So for example, if we want it to go in like zero, zero, like Z, okay, we can use something like that. So this is X, Y, and Z. So in order to shift it in the x-axis, we can do this transform dot translate. Okay. X update zero zero. Okay, because the the y-axis itself doesn't change. It's only the x-axis that change. So this is in the vector x, y, and z. Uh, you understand vectors? Vectors are in Unity. Uh, typically are uh, either two dimensions or three dimensions. If it's two dimension, the first number is the x-axis, the second dimension is the y-axis. If it's three dimensions, okay, is the x, y, and z. So in this case, we're updating the x like that. So transform.translate this x value here. Okay, I'm going to just uh, play this, okay, to just see whether this is working before I show your, um, the script itself for you all to copy it, okay? <laughs> this is important because sometimes when you code things don't work you know then you have to so you see whoa it's working it's moving left and right see can you see that okay so let me just show you all this code here okay and uh, can you all just copy the code over here right now and then i'll be back in like one minute you need to use the toilet for a while okay so just use this uh copy this code here drag the script into your circle and then just check whether your circle can move left and right. Okay. And I'll be back in one minute. Okay. Okay, everyone, I'm back. Okay, I hope uh, it has been working for you. All right, uh, let's ask the question again. Um, for those six or seven of you following me, are you able to get your ball moving left to right using the script? Okay, raise your hands if you are able to. Oh, you are good. You are good. No wonder you are in hackers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Three. Okay, I need wait for one more. Yeah, give me one more. Yeah. So yeah, feel free for those who have uh, done, feel free to go around and play with your player speed. Okay, to get the best uh, movement rate that you like. Okay, so that in your game, you know, you can increase your flexibility of okay. I'll, I'll wait for one more hand. Okay. So I need you all to tell me that you are okay with the uh, ball movement. So there's the recap. Add in these two lines under update. Okay, these two lines under update. And then after that, when you play, your ball should move left and right based on your input. Like this. We it's really cool. Yeah. You could play this all day, like left, right, left, right. Yeah. How is it? Uh, how about the rest? 
like uh, Lino Wu, are you okay? Okay, uh, I, I hope you are okay. <laughs> no response yet from, from you all. But uh, do stop me if you need uh, some, some help. Okay, that's great. All right, so let's show you something cool. Okay, so if you look at this uh, like circle right now, okay, let me put this video here. Yeah, if you look at the circle right now, so far there's no way to edit like the speed of the ball in the editor itself. What if you want to do it? Okay. You can just put in this thing called serialized view. Okay, which will then basically tell the editor, okay, on the right side, the inspector, my player speed is something that is serializable, which is like editable here. So we can actually change this like to 20 over here. So serialized view is quite cool. It allows you to change like private or public variables in the editor itself. So you can see, whoa, look at that. My ball is moving so fast especially good for games that you know you want a uh, very fast user interaction and stuff like that you, you can you can do something like that if i want the ball to move very slow i can even edit in one time so you see now it's one and then it's moving really slowly but one thing to take note if you edit this in runtime uh, is once you end the play button it will go back to whatever it was before the play button was pressed so it's not permanent you want to make it permanent you edit here and uh editing it over here will sort of overwrite the value that is in your script. So do take note of that. If you edit it in the editor, it will overwrite this value here. Okay. My script won't change, it's just that we will use the value here. There are two ways to do this in the editor. One is to use a serialized view, and the other one is to use like, let's call it p-speed. Okay, let's call it p-speed. I, I think put a public variable here. And you will realize that in Unity, all the public variables are shown in the editor. You can see p-speed is shown here on the right side. All can see? So you can change things in the editor based on two ways. First way, serialized view. So you can work for private or public variables. Or public variables, you can also add a serialized view, but it makes no difference because public variables automatically will be shown in the editor. All right. For me, okay, my favorite method to use, okay, for this, okay, it's not really this. Okay, I don't really like to use uh serialized view like that. I normally do it like that. I normally do it with a public here. Okay, and actually there's no real like difference between the two. You use serialized view on a public or use oh, sorry, use serialized view on a private variable or do a public float like that on the I have to declare a public variable. No difference in the editor wise. The difference is that if you use a public here, other classes can edit your your, your variable called player speed. But you know, uh, it doesn't really matter because most of the time you wouldn't edit it. Uh, I mean, you are the one coding anyway. But if you want to like do this in the team or what, it's better to put in private variables so that they cannot uh, other people cannot tamper with your code. Okay, but the reason why I like this better is because uh, it's much shorter. Um, I'm quite lazy to type the word serialized view. Yeah, but yeah, just to do take note of this difference. So serialized view, uh, I got a question, why serialized view? Serialized view basically means that that particular variable itself can be viewed in Unity editor, like over here. So if you want it to be editable in the editor itself, you need to put a serialized view to that variable itself or you declare it as public. Okay, so simple as that. Okay, maybe for to teach you the correct method of doing it, let's just do a private and put a serialized view. Okay, this is the proper method of, of doing it so that you can display on the editor, yet remain the integrity of your class so that the variable cannot be modified from outside the class by doing a private variable. Okay, this might sound quite foreign to people who are not familiar with object-oriented programming. Okay, but rest assured, Okay, you, you, you can uh, just simply declare a public variable and this will still work. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, any questions on this? I'm just showing you how to edit stuff from the editor. 
Okay, no worries. Even if you don't have this thing, you can just edit from your script itself and everything will still work perfectly fine. Okay. Yes, it's either public or private and serialized view. That's correct, Darren. You can also do private and serialized view, but that's just wasting uh, wasting uh, characters because public will automatically be shown on the editor already. Okay. So yeah, this just to demonstrate what uh, Unity can do. So now where are we at? We are at the stage where we have a ball, okay? And we can move the ball left and right in the editor here. Uh, sorry, in, in the game itself. Okay, so a game's not fun, right? If it's just moving left and right like that with a ball, it's not, not that great. We need some challenges to make the player, you know, fight for their lives, you know? Or, or make the player feel engaged. And now let's create the challenge, okay? So we have a ball over here. We want to create an obstacle where the obstacle can kill the player. So right now let's create our obstacle or our brick that will be falling down. So go to game object, right click game, go to game object, 2D object sprites square. I mean, you can use capsule, hexagon. It depends how you want to kill the ball. You know, you can use any shape you want, but for today's demonstration, I'm going to use square. Oh, look at that, the square appeared. Okay, I'm going to shift the square using the W key, shift it up somewhere here. Okay, if you go to our game, you can see it's here. Okay, so you can see the square needs to drop down and crush the ball, okay? So over here, the square, let's make it, I mean, my sample game, I made it red. You can choose any color you want. Okay, uh, red is a sign of danger, so I use red. So we should click play and the and the brick should fall down, right? Right? Hey, no, it didn't fall down. Okay, any of you smart people can tell me what we are lacking here for the brick to fall down. Yeah, based on what we have uh, been talking about so far, how can we make the brick fall down using gravity? Yes, okay, rigid body, yes. Very good. Let's add component to the brick. Rigid body. Is it rigid body or rigid body 2D? 2D. Okay, very good. A rigid body is for 3D games. Okay. Rigid body 2D is for 2D games. So rigid body 2D, dynamic. And we click play and see what happens. Oi! See, very good. It actually fell through. It actually fell through the, the brick itself. And then like uh basically. It's not stopped by the floor. Okay, but what if we want to make it such that it will collide with only the circle, but not the... So I want this brick to collide only with the circle. So in order to do the co collision, what, com what uh, component must we have for this square? Okay, in order to have a collision with the circle. A rigid body is not enough to do the collision. Okay, let's call this brick instead of square, okay? okay this will test your understanding. What other component do I need? in my square in order to make it collide with both the circle and the wall. Anyone? What is the other component that I need to put in my square so that it can collide with the ball and with the, the walls? Yeah, uh, so remember earlier we, for, for the circle and for the walls, we added two components, right? One is rigid body 2D, what's the other component? Yes, very good. Collider 2D. So we can add a collider, uh, a box collider 2D in this case. So if you look at the collider itself, you will see that the collider for a box collider 2D will be wrapped along the square itself. Can you see that? So with this collider, let us see how our game looks like now. Okay, let's take a look. Ready, get set, go. Okay, let's see, let's see. We boom. <laughs> you can see, can push the ball. Oh, something went awry with the collider. Okay, it, it collided with the square and then it got stuck in the wall. So that's why it came like that. Yeah, so um, yeah, you can see that you can, you, you can move the objects like that with the collider in place. Okay, but if you want the, the ball to work properly, we need to do some amendments to reset the rigid body's uh, velocity because it got crushed in the wall. So uh, the, the, the Unity editor is like doing like update like that. So 
But don't worry, the game, when you get hit by the brick, the game will restart. So we won't need to face this issue. Okay, so now an additional challenge, okay? Now I'm gonna show you this thing called uh, different layers, okay? So imagine you want the brick to only hit the ball, but you don't want the brick to hit the wall, okay? So you want to tell the Unity game engine, I want to collide only with the ball, but I don't want to collide with my walls. How? Okay, and that is how we're going to do it right now. So one way is to use layers. So you go to like maybe for walls. Let us go to the wall and then we go to the layer, add layer. And then maybe we can call a layer called walls, like a user layer called wall. All right. And then over maybe in our prefab, you go to the prefab page and the project, you go to your prefab, you go to your wall, you set the prefab to a layer called wall. All right. So over here in all your uh, inspectors, the wall will be called layer wall. All right. Okay. And one, Okay, actually we need to uh two more things. Okay. We need to create okay because the the circle itself okay needs to interact with the uh with the wall but not the brick, right? So let us create a new layer for the circle itself also. So we can call the new layer called circle. Okay. And then for the brick itself, we can also call a new add a new layer called Break. Okay. So over here for the break itself, we set the layer to be break. For the circle itself, we set the layer to be circle. So set circle, wall, and break. Okay. So I will need you all to do this circle, wall, and break. Set the layers respectively for my circle object, for my wall object, and for my break under this layer itself. Okay. And right now, if we play, Actually, you will see no difference, okay? You will still be able to interact with each other. Okay, but what we have done is we have told uh, Unity that there are, there are a few more game objects called the wall, called the brick, and called the circle. And we want to selectively, okay, do the collisions between these layers selectively. Okay, all clear so far. This is a little more advanced, I would say. Uh, I hope you are able to follow. So. We are adjusting the layer of where the objects appear so that we can tell later the physics engine what layers can collide with each other. So maybe I just take a show of hands first. Uh, have you all set your layer? For the walls, you set the layer to be wall, and for your circle, you set it to be circle, and for the brick, you set it to be brick. Are you all okay with that? If you're okay, you just uh, raise your hand to tell me that you're done setting the layer. Oh, very good. We have three hands. I'll wait for one more. So it is a matter of taking your game object, go to your layer, okay, and add a layer here. And then after you add the layer, you set the layer to be like a circle wall brick. Okay, I'm just gonna press on, okay, because we have limited time. Okay, we have three hands right now. Uh layer is to tell the physics engine later on. I will show you how to do it, which layers should collide with each other. Okay, because right now we want the brick to only collide with the ball, with the ball, but we don't like to collide with the wall because we want it to like sort of pass through the wall for this game. Okay, so how do we go and tell the physics engine how to do it? Okay, it's under edits. It's edits project settings. Okay, so I repeat again edit. Project settings, physics 2D. Okay, then now we have this uh, very, very interesting thing. Okay, this thing is called the layer collision matrix. I'm not sure if you can see this, but uh, we have a layer collision matrix over here at the bottom. So you can see the different layers here. So, so remember, we want our brick, okay, to collide with the circle, okay? But we don't want the brick to collide with the wall, so you can uncheck this. From, from wall. So brick collides with everything, okay, except the wall. Okay, all good. So bricks, the brick object will collide with a circle, with everything else, except the wall. 
In fact, actually, we don't really need this uh, circle layer. Okay, you can just set it to be the default layer. As long as you have this brick and the wall, and you set the brick not to collide with the wall, like what I, I did, I just uncheck this box here. Okay, so just uncheck this box here between brick and wall. Okay, I hope you all can see this. Uncheck the box between brick and wall. This is important. This will tell the Physics 2D engine what layers don't collide with each other. So this is quite important because like in games like you do like Super Mario, sometimes you want some clouds to move in the background, right? But you don't want your Super Mario to jump and hit the clouds and, and get collided. So you set the clouds in a separate layer and you tell the physics engine, okay, all these are my UI or all these are my background. So your player don't collide with the background. Yeah, another way to do it, this is just not to add the collider to the, the clouds. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, these are some ways you can get your, get your physics engine to settle the collisions for you. So now that we have uh, like sort of resolved the collisions, now what we should see is that we, this square will only collide the circle. Oh, do you see that? And the square will drop all the way down. Okay, I take a quick pause here. Are you all able to get what I'm getting? So what you should be getting right now is that the, the square collides with the circle like what you see here, but it can fall through the wall. Okay, so I take a quick pause here. Uh, recap what you need to do. You need to go to each object. Okay, you need to go to each object and then go to the layer, set the layer, like wall for the walls, brick for the bricks, and uh, circle for the circle. Okay, and then you go to edit, project settings. Okay, edit, project settings. And you go to physics 2D. You go to the bottom, layer collision matrix. You turn off collision between your bricks and wall. Okay, so uh, the collision, uh, excuse me, you are, we are talking about the layer itself, right? Technically, you only need to set the collision for the bottom wall because only the brick, the brick will only fall through the bottom wall. Yeah, you don't have to set through all the walls. You only need to set the, the wall layer for the bottom wall. But you know, you, can, you should also just set it for all walls. I mean, no harm in this game. So I, okay, take a quick poll of hands. Who here has gotten their bricks to fall through the wall, but not fall through the circle? Yeah, so I'll just pause here for a while. So this is, is quite cool. You can use this to create stuff. Like, you know, if you like to create a top-down shooter, you want to have certain uh, stuff at the background where, you know, you should have other planes fighting each other at the back but your main plane doesn't get affected by all this. You can have the other planes at the bottom to get put in another layer where they can fight each other. And then your planes at the top can be another layer. So your top and bottom won't hit each other, but they can all be projected in the same space. So that's cool, right? Your physics duty can settle different kind of layers. It's like fighting in the air, fighting in the sea. The sea and sea can collide, but the air and air collide, but the air and sea cannot collide. Yeah, so you can do that using layers and you can change which layers collide with each other using the coll layer collision matrix in Unity. Okay, I see three hands. I guess that means we are ready to move on, right? I want something cool, right? So what do we do next? Okay, you realize a slight issue over here, right? You see, after the brick falls down from the... <laughs> let's go here. After the brick falls down from the... from the ball, right? Let's, let's make the brick fall down. You see, the brick is falling down to nowhere. Can you see, can you see that? Can you see that? The brick has fallen, I think somewhere here now. Yeah, so <laughs> you can see that the brick's position. If you look at the brick, I mean, the, you may not see anything over here. <laughs> you see, it's so calm and peaceful over here. But can, can you see something? Can you see that the brick itself is, is still descending down? It's still falling down, you know, it doesn't end there. It's still dropping as we speak. The, the, the physics engine is still updating this brick to continue dropping. And imagine if you drop a thousand of these bricks. Imagine the load that you can have on the Unity game engine itself. Yeah, so we need to solve this, right? Okay, I see some hands raised. Uh, do you have questions, uh, Dominic or Dot? Or you're just saying that you have uh, done it? Okay, I, I take it that you have done it. Okay, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask, you know? Okay, don't have to be shy, okay? I want you all to understand here, okay? The idea is not to show like how complex Unity is. The idea is to show you how, how to use it, okay? 
So obviously something needs to be done here, right? We cannot allow this free falling brick to go root and, and uh, like keep dropping and dropping even when it has passed the useful area. Okay, so how do we do this? We need to destroy anything that is past a certain uh, height. Okay, one way to do it is using script on the square itself. But I'm going to show you a way that I find very useful. Okay, so in order to do this method, uh, what we do is this. We create a new, actually, we can just take the wall. Yeah, we can just take the wall here. Okay, just duplicate a wall. Okay, and just put it at the bottom. Yeah, so this wall, you can call it a collider. Uh, you can call it destroyer. Call this wall the destroyer. So anything that passes through this wall will be destroyed. Okay, how, how do we do this? How do we put the destroyer on this object? Okay, in order to, upon contact with this brick, destroy that brick. Okay, so the idea is when the brick falls down on this destroyer, the brick should be destroyed. Okay, how, how do we do this? It, this destroyer, okay, let, let us see how to do it. Well, firstly, before we do this, I need you to go to prefect and like unpack the prefect completely because uh, we don't want any, any things that we do on this uh, new object called destroyer to affect our walls. So we unpack this prefect completely. It cuts off the link with the parent prefect, okay, with the wall itself. And then we will basically have a, an independent object called destroyer. Okay, so uh, right click, prefect, unpack prefect completely. Okay, or you can just create another, uh, another sprite, a, a square sprite, and add in a rigid body 2D and a box collider. Okay, so next, what do we need to do? Okay, we need to do a certain collision uh, detection such that upon colliding with something, destroy the particular game object. Okay, that's the basically the function. Oops, wrong not, not folder. That's the function of the collider uh, of the destroyer. So in your scripts, I need you to right click, create. C sharp script, C sharp scripts, and we call this the destroyer. Okay, so in this destroyer, okay, what we need to do is we need to do this on collision, enter 2D. It's a void actually, because we don't return it. Okay. Okay, so let me just type in the code first. So on collision enter 2D will mean that uh, when two objects collide, okay, it will trigger this script. Okay, and in this script, it will take into account the collider 2D of the other object that has collided with it. And then from this collider 2D, we can then destroy the game object. So let me just show you how uh, on collision enter 2D looks on Unity. So this is the function that Unity provides. Okay. So uh, okay, sorry, it's a collision 2D, not collider 2D. So with every collision, there'll be a collision object generated that will detail what is the object that collided with it, what, what's the force that, co that collides and so on. You can use this uh, on collision enter 2D, okay, in order to do your collision detection. So this is a collision 2D. So can you all do a code like this? Okay, let me just make sure it's working first before I let y'all copy this, okay? Let me just make sure it's working. I don't need to copy a, a, a code that is not working. So we put it in the destroyer. Oops. And then uh, basically now my destroyer has the destroyer code that I've just typed out. I click play. I see whether um, the brick when falls through and hits the destroyer, whether it's destroyed. So let's go back to scene. Okay. And I go to my game. I move my ball away. Oh. Oh, it's not destroyed yet. Okay, so there's something wrong here. So let's see. Okay, my 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 collider here should be able to collide the ball. Oh, I know why. Because the layer is in layer wall. Remember <laughs> the, the brick doesn't collide the wall? Yeah, so let's put this back to like layer default. Yeah, let, let, let me play. So I'm supposed to have the destroyer upon contact with this red brick, destroy the red brick. So let's take a look. 
Oh, do you see that? It destroyed. Okay, so this is the code to do it. On collision, enter 2D, and then you take in this collision 2D uh, object, and then you call the evoke the destroy method by Unity, and you destroy that game object. Okay, so I'll just pause here for a while. Okay, uh, create a script called destroyer. Okay, put in this on collision enter 2D method. Okay, and then after that, just put it into the destroyer. Okay. And the destroyer, just make sure that um, the layer is not a wall. Okay, if not, um, the physics engine is not going to collide with, it's not going to collide this square with this brick. Okay, I'll give you all like maybe one minute to, to type this out. I'll show you the code again. On collision, enter 2D. Can we save the whole project from time to time? Yes, you can. Uh, you can press Control S to save. Or I believe there's a file save. Yeah, yeah, you can save, you can save your project. Okay, I'm just gonna give some time. Uh sorry, sorry for the changing of my screen. I'm just gonna give some time for y'all to, to do this. Okay. Uh hands up if you are completed with the when the square hits your collider, it it, uh, it removes that square. How do we exit play mode? Oh, sorry, I didn't go through this earlier. But um, you know, exit play mode, you just click on the play button again. So let's say I click on play. Oh, I know why your game objects disappeared. You must have created them during play mode. So anything that you create or anything that edit during play mode will be gone after you exit. Oh my gosh. I, I hope you haven't been in play mode since the start because they had to recreate everything. So so you, you just need to click here again to exit play mode. So uh, thanks for pointing this out. I guess I'll take note for my next <laughs> well, I'll make sure that I'll tell people whatever you create during play mode is not permanent. Okay. I guess you have experienced uh firsthand the devastating effects of this. Okay, uh, but don't worry, the game is quite simple. I'm sure she can create all the way until here again. Yeah. But yeah, uh you can exit play mode by clicking the play button at the top. Okay. All right. So uh, I have three hands already. Uh, Dominic and the dots, dot and dot dot. All right. So okay, I will move on. Yeah, I hope the rest are okay. I guess you can refer to the video if you need some like backtracking. Okay. So let's go on. So we have a destroyer that destroys the brick when it touches it. Uh, I'm just going to give you some extra information here that is not needed for this game, but just to let you know. Okay, for your uh, box collider, you can also set as trigger. So uh, if you set as trigger, okay, you can also destroy the square, okay? okay what is a trigger and what is a collider, okay? A trigger basically doesn't invoke a collision, but once you touch the object, it triggers something. You know, if you play those RPG games, you walk through the forest, you walk to a certain area, then you trigger a random encounter, that kind of thing. So you can put a, like a, if you do RPG games like those kind of thing, you can put a, a transparent box, and then once you pass through that box, it goes to a cutscene and so on. So a trigger, uh, you can interact with the object, but it has no collision. But you can trigger a certain uh function to be called. So you also can do on trigger enter two D, and destroy the game object using this. So just to give you an example of how to do it, so. You can just copy and paste like and something like this on trigger enter 2D collider 2D. Okay, so essentially it is the same thing. <laughs> so if you were to use a trigger to destroy it, it's possible also. Yeah, so I can just uh, use it on trigger enter 2D as well. So so um when it Yes, uh, because now my destroyer is a trigger instead of a uh, collider. Uh, the collider itself is a, a trigger. So you see, you can also destroy the, the square. Okay. And just so you know, you know, the issue about not uh, having, or rather the issue about the, the brick needing to pass through the wall, right? Okay. 
if let's say you use only the brick itself, you can set the wall to be a trigger also, so you can like, pass through the wall. Okay, but in this case, you cannot because the ball itself needs to stay on the, on the wall. Okay, so that's why I had to use this layer method to separate it. Okay, I'm going through a little bit like extra, okay. <laughs> but I, I thought it's quite interesting that there's this trigger and this collision. And you know, for those of you all who are interested to do your own game dev next time, there's also a collision exits, which means that after the collision happens, you trigger this function. A collision stay to the, which means that if, as long as it keeps colliding, what do you do? So over here, we just have a function on collision enter to the, which will tell us what to do when the two objects first collide. Okay. So uh, let's go back to the destroyer being a non-trigger. Okay. Over here. Okay, so uh, we are done with the uh, the object falling down like that. Okay, so if you look at the game right now, okay, it's not that interesting right now. We have one object that, that, that fall like that, and that's it. Okay, what if we want to make the object keep falling at regular intervals? Okay, how should we do that? Okay, how should we do this? Okay, so this is the next level. Okay, this is a object spawner. Okay, so now we have this destroyer. Okay. I want to make this destroyer. Oh, sorry, I want to make. Oh, we have a brick here. I want to make this brick a prefab. Anyone can tell me how to do it. How do I make this brick a prefab? Which means that I want to keep it to be something that is like uh safe, so that every time an instance of a brick is called, it will be the same brick. Okay, I see something in the chat. Drag into prefab folder. See, you are good. You are good. See, you all know how to do it. Drag into prefab folder. Exactly. Two second method to create a prefab. That's it. We have our break prefab. Very good. Okay. So now, what I want to do next, I need to create a break spawner. Okay. So in order to do a break spawner, okay, one way. Okay, maybe it's a a better way to do it like that so that we keep it neat. Okay. Let's uh create a new game object, 2D object, sprite, square. Okay, we call this a brick spawner. Okay, so wherever this brick position is, okay, the square will spawn from there. Okay, so we have a brick spawner here. You can, you can delete the original brick already, actually. You can delete the brick. Yeah, as long as you create in the prefab, you can remove the brick from your scene, okay? So the brick spawner will be where you want the brick to spawn, okay? So let's set it at a, at a height of maybe four. Okay, it really depends on you. Okay, so let us do this code right now for the brick spawner such that the brick will spawn at regular intervals and drop down on the player. Okay, so let's do the brick spawner now. All right, are you all ready to do it? Okay, yeah, I hope you are. So let us create a new C sharp script. It's called brick spawner. Okay, so what I need to do right now is to instantiate a copy of the brick itself so that the brick can actually fall down from this game object. Okay, so firstly, let's create a private variables and a public variables here. So I can create a game object. Well, actually, the public should go first. I'll make a public variable called the game object and we call it break prefab. Okay, which means uh, this is the prefab that needs to be spawned at this location. Okay, and okay, this is the interesting thing. In the private variables, we have a float time. Okay, the time will be zero. Okay, and then we also have float mean spawn time equals to maybe about two seconds. And the max spawn time will be First, we don't need to spawn at regular intervals. You know, people can predict the pattern. We want to give it some randomness, maybe about 10 seconds. Two to 10 seconds, maybe. Okay, so we have two seconds minimum and max spec uh, 10. Okay. And in order to do a spawning, okay, we have a, we set the time at the initialization to be random.range mean spawn time, max spawn time. Okay, so uh, give you an idea of random dot range. Basically, it gives you a number between minimum and maximum. Okay, if the numbers are floats, then it's inclusive for both the min and max. If the numbers are integers, 
like zero to five, it'll be a random number from zero all the way to four. So it's uh, exclusive of the max if it's integers. But if it's a float, it's uh, inclusive. Okay, uh, so this basically gives you a random number within this range. So when we call an update, this is what we do. Okay, this is the, the source. Okay, the source of how to, to do a spawner. Okay, so we can do this time minus equals to. Okay, so this is a shorthand. Okay, <laughs> time. So actually, time dot delta time is in seconds. So, so we can do a time minus equals delta, uh, time dot delta time. For those who don't know programming, uh, this is the same as doing this. Yeah. You are just subtracting uh, time dot delta time every frame from this time. Okay. So let's just do the shorthand. Time minus equals time dot delta time. If, okay, now we do an if loop here. Okay, if loop is basically if the condition is met, then we do whatever is after in that curly brackets. So if time is smaller or equals to zero. Okay, so what we did do is instantiate or basically spawn the brick. Okay, so over here we can do an instantiate. Instantiate takes in a few parameters. First, it takes in the brick prefab itself. Then it takes in a location to spawn. So over here we can do transform dot position, which is the, the brick spawner's current position. Okay, and then after that, it takes in a photonion. Okay, maybe I show you all the site. Okay, I show you all how the insertion method work, works. Okay. So over here, we are using this method. There are a few ways to do it. We are doing this instantiate object, vector tree position, and the quarter neon rotation. A quarter neon is uh, a way of doing like a spin for the object. Uh, uh, in 2D games, you don't have to worry about it. It's mainly for 3D games. Okay, so when we instantiate, we need to give a quarter neon also. So we give it quarter neon dot identity, which is like uh, no spin. Okay, so we spawn the brick at this position. Okay, and then after that, we will set the next time for the break spawn. And yeah, that's it for break spawning code. Okay, I will go and test and see whether it's working first before I let you all uh, copy it. Okay, so this will be the break spawner. Okay, I always got errors when you code. Yeah, it's a, it's a, oh, the name transform does not exist. I typed one and less, it's like that. So let's see. Okay, so in my brick spawner now, I'm gonna put the brick spawner script that I just created inside the brick spawner. Okay, and I'm gonna remove the sprite renderer over here so that you don't see the sprite anymore. I mean, I can keep it there to just show you how it looks like. Okay, but I want the brick to appear. So. You can see right now, oh, something happened. Oh, I haven't created, oh, okay. So uh, there's, there's a few things that I haven't done. Uh, I haven't actually put the prefab here yet. So one thing is I want to make this brick spawner a prefab, so I'm going to prefabs folder. In the prefabs folder, okay, in the brick prefab, I'll drag the brick prefab over here so that you can reference this brick. Okay, with two, these two things I did, Okay, my brick spawner itself should be able to generate these bricks once every random interval set seconds. So between two to 10 seconds, this brick will, should be able to come out. So let's wait to see whether, ah, there we go. So it's, it will begin uh, dropping the bricks at intervals between two to 10 seconds. Ah, there we go. Okay, so it's working. I think you all can copy the code right now. Uh, let me just show you all again what I did for the brick spawner. I basically drag the brick spawner into the prefabs. In the prefabs itself, I drag the brick into the brick prefab position here so that I tell the script, instantiate this brick itself. And lastly, for this brick spawner, I can uncheck this sprite renderer so that it, this white square doesn't appear in the game itself. So this white square is only there to like guide us as to where the, the generator is. Okay, it should be empty in the game itself. So in the actual game itself, it should look like this. Okay, it should look like this. Okay, wait for it. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have set it at 10 seconds. So is it the brick falls now? So you wait again between two to 10 seconds, another brick will fall now. Okay, so let's get things cracking. I go back to the script for the brick spawner and 
Yeah, you have about one to two minutes to, to type just now. Yeah. Maybe the next one time I change to five. Yeah. And we should serialize view this one also. So that we can edit this in the game editor. Okay, all this is done. I'll let you copy this code here. When you are done copying the code and uh, making sure that it works and can spawn the, the bricks, uh, I want you to just give me a, a hands up. Uh, Chaitanya, we have until 4.30, is it? Or 4? So typically it's still 4, but if you want to continue, I think feel free. Uh, if you want to rush, feel free as well. But um, I mean, if people want to stick, they can stick as well. But the well, the timing I announced was two to four. Okay, sure. Uh, because yeah, I, think, I think the additional time is for QA if they want. Okay, sure, sure. I think I might need a little bit more time. Because, sure. uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's all right. Yeah. Can you repeat the part about making break spawner the prefab? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so make break spawner a prefab. Okay, then go to break spawner itself under the prefabs itself. You will notice that inside the script here. In break spawner, there's a break prefab uh, section. Okay, then you can drag the break from your prefabs inside here. Okay, so this will tell the script, okay, when you want to instantiate the game object, instantiate this variable here, which is the break object. Okay, uh, is, that, is that clear? I, I hope that's clear. Uh, ooh. Okay, so I go back to the script. Okay, I just wait for one more hand. Okay, because uh, Dominic and uh, Dot has uh, finished. And dot dot has finished, so we just wait for one more person to finish. So the dot is done also. All right, that's great. Uh, oh, I hope you are able to get it out also. Yeah. Yep. Okay, that's great. Let's move on. All right. Actually, I sort of expected that I might overrun a bit because uh, normally when I'm doing live. I tend to take a bit longer than I am when I do my Twitch streams. <laughs> Just yeah, then to go through more in depth. Okay, so now we have the uh let's see. Now we we have the game flow more or less working. Okay, now is the challenge. Okay. Remember my break spawner here? Okure, there's this uh I, I just turn on the sprite renderer now. I mean you can go to prefab and turn it on. The, turn on the sprite renderer of your brick spawner. Okay, so one thing I want you all to do right now is it's quite uninteresting to only have bricks fall down from one area, right? So I need you all to copy and paste this brick spawner into the entire row. Let me demonstrate to you how to do it like one. Okay, so you just over here, maybe in your x axis, you do a minus one for this. And then you duplicate. Yeah, basically I, I, I duplicate many of them. And then I just changed my position here. Minus two, minus three. Yeah, y'all can go on and do it. Basically duplicate the brick spawner such that it spawns the entire top row. Okay, leave no space uncovered. Okay, we, we don't want the player to have a blind spot. We want the player to feel threatened at all areas. Okay, that's a good game. Okay, the player can find a loophole and that's a, that's a cheat code. Okay, we don't want a player to have an easy life. Okay make life as tough as possible, you know, like how they do for exams, you know, make, make your life tough. Yeah, make the player fight for his life. Okay, <laughs> with all the bricks falling like that. Okay, so we have uh, brick spawners all across the, the top. Okay, so you can see like that. Uh, yeah, so duplicate your brick spawners, change the position. Okay, it should be in, in integer coordinates like one, two, three, four, five, because your brick scale is one, 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 I hope. So we go to the brick spawner, we can uncheck the sprite renderer. Okay, and then in the game, oh, wow, how come it's not applied? Okay, no, no worries. I think I might have edited the sprite renderer while in the scene itself, so I can just mess uncheck. The, the, okay, so I want you all to create the Sprite render, uh, you create the brick spawner for the entire top row. I give you all some time to do it, okay? Well, you can see, you know, this is how it looks like after you have created it. So a random between two to five seconds will look like this. 
Okay, so I, I got, got hit by the ball. Okay, we are almost there, Eddie. Okay, we are almost there with uh, the entire game. Okay, I need y'all to just tell me when you're done. Okay, Dot and Dominic is done. So uh, when you have created the entire row of brick spawners at the top, let me just show you all again. Maybe I should fly all the prefabs. Okay, that, 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 that better not. <laughs> yeah, so when you see all your sprite renderers at the top like that, spread across the entire screen, then you're done. Okay, so let's check the sprite renderer. Oh, okay, for uh, the rest. Okay, so uh, we are more or less done with, uh, almost done with the game. We just need one last step, okay, one final step, which is basically when you have a ball, uh, the brick hitting you, we should like restart the game or like end condition. If you have a, if an, another scene for like you win that kind of thing, you can also transit to those scenes. Yeah. So I'm going to show you how to do a very simple like restart of the game. So you can go to your player. Okay. So in the player itself, I'm just going to assume that you are uh, Diana Okay. So I'll go to the player itself. So we want upon contact with this brick. Okay, we want to contact with this brick over here. We want the player to sort of like uh, know that yes, it's dead. Okay, so how do we do this? Okay, one way to do it is to use the layer itself and differentiate. Okay, but I'm going to show you the easier method, which is the tag method, it's a shorter method. So, tags are like tags you put on your objects to differentiate what kind of objects they are. So, we can add a tag to this brick itself, add a tag, and we call this a brick. Okay, so we go back to our bricks. We put a tag called brick. Okay, in our in our bricks in the in the prefab. So my brick itself should have a tag called brick right now. So you go to brick add tag plus put the name brick, and then you go back to your brick itself add this tag here. Okay. So uh yeah, before I move on, I give you all like maybe one minute. Make sure that you have a tag called a brick on your brick object. And then you just raise your hands after you're done with that. Yeah, Chaitanya, I will take maximum until 4.30. Yeah, that's the, the right hand marker for me. Okay, Dominic is done. How about the rest? Uh, are you all able to do, get the tech working for your break? I'll just wait for one more hand, maybe. Uh, just change this tag to a brick, a brick tag. Okay, great. Okay, you are good. Okay, you are good. All right, let's go back to the code. Okay, so how do we handle collisions? Okay. Anyone can tell me what is the function to use to determine when a collision happens? What is the function name called? It's called on collision. Anyone? The one that we used just now for the. Yes, on collision and third duty. Thank you, Devashan. Okay, so void. Oops. So in your player, in your player script, we call void. Oops. Void on collision and the 2D. Okay. Collision 2D other. If other dot game object dot tag, I think it's, I think this uh, other dot game object dot tag. If the tag is a brick, okay, it means that you have died. Okay, you have died. <laughs> so what we do is, uh, so you need to reload scene. Okay, so we can reload the scene like this. Game manager dot sorry, uh, scene manager, upload scene, okay, scene manager, you, you can load the scene name actually, you can just load scene like this, uh, you can load scene, like, load, load, load uh, whatever, whatever name you gave your scene, like that, now maybe we do this, it's easier, so under your scenes itself, whatever name you call it, 
you can you can load here like that this is one way to do it okay so uh you can just reload the scene like that if you have died okay and we need to at the top here using unity engine dot scene manager okay sorry scene management using unity engine dot scene management and then now here we do it like that let me just see whether it works okay let's see so when uh the break collides with the ball is supposed to reload the scene let's see oh it works look at that Boop. it reloads the scene you all see that Boop. yeah so let me just show you the code again and in this code at the top is a is a module imports so we import unity engine dot scene management okay add in Sorry, maybe I delete away this view. Okay, because we don't need all this. Add in Unity Engine .scene management, and then add in a collide on collision enter two D. Check the game objects tag. Okay, to see whether it's a break. If it's a break, then then we reload the scene. Okay, so let us uh, see whether you are okay to do that. Okay, so this is how it should look like after it's all done. Okay, when the brake hits you, you reload the scene. Ah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, you see, the game is like almost there, lacking some score counter. Okay, if not, everything is more or less almost there. Already. Okay, uh, I would like to just ask you all to give me a show of hands if... Uh, if you are able to do this okay for when the break hits the ball uh reload the scene hey very good okay so uh actually this is a really cool way to do it okay so i'm going to show you something even more like, cooler okay what if you want to see like your death for a while? Like basically, once you die, you don't load straight away. You want to wait maybe one second before you load the scene so let the player see how, how they died, you know, or how the square crush the ball. Okay, so uh okay, this is slightly more advanced, okay, but I think this is quite important for your games if you were to create them. Uh, this basically is about treading. Okay, threading as in T H R E A D threads. Okay, Unity itself does not allow for like a delay function or like a wait for a certain amount of time in the main thread of your code, right here. Because if you were to do it in the main thread, what will basically happen is once you reach this game object, you wait for like one or two seconds, and then everything else needs to wait for this one or two seconds to run finish before it executes another bunch of codes on other game objects. So Unity does not allow you to like delay for a certain amount of seconds within the code like that itself. But it allows you to create core routines, which are something like threads, like parallel threads that run and then execute certain things uh, separately apart from the main routine. So I'm going to show you how to reload this scene using core routine. So it's very simple. You just need to do this I enumerator, which is basically a core routine. So we call it reload. Okay. Inside here, we u return new wait for seconds, which will wait for one second. And then after that, we reload the scene here. Like that. So over here, we replace this with start coroutine. Reload. Like that. So this is a bit more advanced. Uh, feel free not to do this. Okay, it doesn't affect the gameplay. But uh, this basically will delay for like one second after you die, then reload the scene. Let me just test whether it's okay before I let you all like, copy this code. So this is called code routine. You can use this to like do a delay and then load the next scene and so on. Let me just check. So there'll be a delay of one second, then load the next scene. Do you see that? For one second, you can see like how you have died before, before it reloads. 
Okay, so uh, this is for those interested. We can do stuff like this, like coroutines. Okay. So, yeah, I will. Okay, should I just pause here for a while? Do uh, you want to implement this? Uh, it's just for info. I mean, this could be just for info. Uh, this is something interesting, but um, it doesn't affect the gameplay for this game. Okay, maybe I do one last thing okay before i end the session okay it's called scoring okay we don't really uh have much of a challenge right now because uh, we don't have a running score to tell the player how far they have survived right so we will need something for a score so this is where ui comes in okay ui so in game itself right click game object ui and then click text okay everyone do this game object ui text so you see, wow, this huge canvas has appeared like that. So you can do your text in this canvas. And then um, this rectangle here basically is the screen space itself. But I don't like to have a screen space for, for the canvas that is like separate from the, the main scene itself. So what you can do is in render mode, you can do screen space camera and drag the main camera here. Okay. So with this, your UI itself, your text, where's my text? My text is here. You will appear within the main camera itself. Drag the text somewhere to the top. Okay, like maybe enlarge the text a bit. Okay, we can just call this like score XXX. Okay, change the thing to best fit. Color, white color, something like that. Yeah, you can centralize this like that. So if you look at your game itself, you see there's this score thing that happened. So let me just show you again how to do this. Canvas, or you create a UI. Okay, then go to Canvas, render mode, go to screen space camera, drag the main camera in here. Okay, and in your text over here, you can set your font, your, your, your font size and so on. But basically set the color to be like white. So you have this thing like score, dot, dot, xxx, something like that. So I'm just gonna pause here for like one minute. And uh, you just tell me when, uh, when you're able to create like a canvas UI that has this score over here. Okay, just hands up after you have done this. So it will basically be uh, creating a UI here, screen space camera, and then your text itself. You drag the text to the top, open up the box a bit, okay. Select best fit, centralize it a bit. You, you should see something like this. Okay, I will just give you all maybe uh, one minute to try to do this. Yeah, this one is a little more complicated because like the UI itself is on a is on a different plane from the game objects. So yeah, maybe y'all can take a bit more time to try to get this out. Ah, where to put screen space camera? Okay, you go to canvas itself on the right here. You have this render mode on your canvas that you can go put screen space camera here. Yeah, uh, is that clear? It's under canvas. Yeah, okay, I guess you found it. And you just drag the text to the, maybe the top left or the top right, wherever you want the text to be. Then you have the text for the, the score over there. Yeah. yeah, thanks for sticking through today. Uh, actually today, what I thought you all is like uh, quite advanced stuff, like basic to, to intermediate stuff. Okay, the, the beginner game will just be basically move, making the ball move left to right. And then we have just ended the session here. But I thought, no, it won't be very fun if we were to just do a game where the ball moves left and right without anything to do. Yeah, so yeah, it's it might be a little daunting for like first timers, but I think, I, I hope you all have learned something from it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we just wait a while for people to be done with the text. Are you all okay with the text so far?
Yeah, just wait a while for at least a few hands to be up. If not, I think I've lost you. Oh, great. We have our first hand. That's great. So for, okay, we have two hands already. So it's basically Canvas. Okay, you, you basically UI text. Okay, you go to Canvas, you go to text, and then you drag the text to the top left corner using the tools up here. And then type in the text, and then you have like font size. Uh, you select best fit, and then align to the center. You can even change the text color if you want. Yeah, but white is fine for this. So if you click play now, I'm just going to go on to the last part of the, the game. Okay, so you click play now, you see all the, the squares coming down. You hit, you restart. Okay, but you see over here, we have a score here. And we, what we want to do is we want to update our score. Okay, so let us do a very simple way to update our score. Go back to the script. I'm just going to do it uh, in, the, in the simplest possible way. Okay, so we have an integer. We call it score is zero in the player script. And every time we update, we're going to add the score by one. And we're going to change our display text. Okay, so over here, we need a public variable called score text. So we have a text. So uh, we have a public text called score text. And uh, this text is basically a, a class type that contains the text variable itself. And we need to add in this thing called unity engine.ui, like that. And then finally, in order to update the text, okay, this is a little more. Let me just explain what I'm doing. So I created, I added this unity engine.ui. Okay, I have a score text that I have over here at the top. Okay, which will take in uh, the text that I've just created. And then during my update, I increase my score, and then I will just change my score text text to give you the score, like score dot dot is what, okay? And that's all I'm going to create, okay? And if, okay, let me just show you all how to do the next part. Okay, and in my circle itself, which contains the player script, I can then, in the score text, okay? I can then drag this canvas text and put here, like that. Yeah, because this text here is a score text. So if you were to play the game right now, what we will see is that, can you see that the score is updated? As you play the game, the score is updated. I mean, even if you die, when, when actually you die, you can stop the score from updating. Okay? I'm not going to go through that right now. It's just a few logic codes where you do some Boolean checks whether you are dead or not. They, but you can see that the score is being updated until you hit a break and die. Come on. Yeah, okay, that makes that that. Okay, so uh, that's more or less it for the game. Okay, uh, yeah. Are you all okay with the last part? The last part is just basically updating the text itself to update the current score. Okay, I'll just leave this here for a while. Uh, you know, when you're okay with like this score part, so basically it's adding these two lines, add in this score text here, add in this score here, and then later drag in in your in your game object, your in your player itself. You drag in in the score text, you drag in the canvas text inside here. Okay, I'm just gonna leave this code here for like one, two minutes. You just uh for those who are done, just raise your hand so I know that you can do it. Yeah, this score is quite important because, you know, without this score, the game has no meaning, right? <laughs> yeah, I hope you're okay. <laughs> yeah, but I would say that if you have been able to follow like maybe 90% or 80 to 90% of this is good enough. Okay, the last part, 
I would say that I went through a little fast because of the time constraints. Uh, so if you do uh, need any like clarifications or what, please feel free to ask them now. Uh, is, is anyone able to do this, uh, this part where you add the Question of the chat. Yeah. I have a now reference exception. Oh, okay. Uh, ooh, you have to check whether or not you have this uh, in your circle itself. In the score text, do you drag in the canvas text inside here? Because if you do not drag it in, then uh, there might be this now object reference error where you are referencing nothing. Yeah, if you did, if it didn't, if it didn't drag in this text here. Yeah, uh, we, we, are you are you able to understand that? Like you might need to drag drag and drop in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, maybe we just uh, I'll go back to the script page. I just wait a while for for people to to finish coding this, okay. Okay, great. We have two people who have completed it. Uh, all right. I hope uh, you are able to enjoy the game. Yeah, so <laughs> there's uh, different things that you can add on to this game. I mean, some add-ons that I think that you have is you can make the ball jump, okay? Uh, but it doesn't really matter much for this game because uh, one thing I can think of is that instead of only the ball dropping down from horizontally, there could be like missiles flying from left to right that you need to jump over as well, <laughs> make the game a bit harder, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, there could be also other things like you can set the speed of the brakes dropping from the from the top. Maybe at the beginning you let the interval be longer so that it's easier for the player. But towards the end, you can make it something like this where it's like a nightmare where everything keeps falling. So things like that. I mean, different things on game concept design. Like you can have more than one ball. Maybe <laughs> yeah, you you could have brakes being smaller, bigger balls being bigger or smaller add more power-ups and so on. So all these are different game concept ideas you can have for this kind of game. And yet, really the limit is just your imagination actually. Uh, whatever you imagine, most probably you can program it out if you know how to do it. Okay, anyway, I've come to the end of today's uh, sharing. I hope um, this has been interesting, especially for those of you who have uh, followed through with the Unity one. I hope you have been able to walk home with a. Uh, or maybe at home already, but I hope that you are able to have a working game and yeah, be, be proud of yourself. Yeah, it's your first game that you've created. Right, a round of applause for, for your first game. Okay, maybe uh, we have a short like five to ten minutes here. I would like to just take any questions you have uh regarding like the game coding or can be anything else in general. Yeah, maybe you have anything you want to ask. For the rest, uh, Wu, are you okay to are you are you able to code the score thing? Yeah, there are a few questions in the chat. Yeah. Okay. I have one more clarification. Okay. How do we open the layer editor, the one which we can check the layers in the edit panel at the top? Okay, uh, like this. So if you go to the game object itself, you go to layers, 
add layer. Here you can see this entire uh, text and layers here. You can also add text here actually. Yeah. So over here you can add in your user defined layers. Okay. All right. And uh, at which part of this code is the score reset to zero? Okay. So actually, once we like initialize it, uh, the score is zero over here. Okay. So that's why when we reset the game itself, the score will go to zero. But if you want to be want to be dogmatic about it in your start method, you can set the score to be zero. Here. So uh, before the update frame is first caught, you can make the score zero. Sorry, Uwu, can you uh what, what do you mean by this when we want to prevent the block from hitting the wall? Oh, you mean, you mean when you want the brick to not hit the the, the wall, but uh, hit the brick, right? So uh, firstly, can I check that your wall has already the uh, layer wall? Okay, the brick has the layer, sorry, the standard prefix. The brick has the layer brick and the circle has the layer circle. Can I check you all have, you have this already? Okay, go to edit, project settings. Okay, physics 2D layer collision matrix. And over here, you can see that you can control the brick and the wall by just unchecking this brick to wall section. Okay, I hope that clarifies. Yeah, okay. Uh yeah, feel free to ask your questions, you know. Let's clarify them. Yeah. I mean, I've covered quite a bit of ground today on physics 2D, collisions, UI updating, object spawning. All these are quite uh pretty difficult stuff to do in Unity. Usually for the first session, I will normally teach uh button pressing, how to create buttons and, and scene loading. But I thought it's quite uninteresting to do for like a workshop. <laughs> to just teach you how to create but uh, click buttons and go from scene to scene. So I decided to do something more experimental. Yeah. Do let me know if it's too 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 tough though. Yeah. So I can tone down next time when I do a beginner stop. Yeah. <laughs> I hope this has been manageable. Oh I I do you think the pace is too fast or you are okay? Okay, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, dot 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 ask, uh, what's the way which part of the code to write to save an attribute like maximum score so that it will not be reset to zero? It's a very interesting question. Okay. Uh unfortunately, when you restart your scene, okay, these variables are going to be deleted. Okay, there's only one way to do it. Or rather, there's only one way I, I do it. It's called player press. Okay, so um there's a way to like player prefs dot. So in player prefs, it's like a meta variable where, where it's like you store things that basically once you reset, you can get. So they will be stored in a, in a location where, so you can use player, player prefs to get in or set in. So for example, you want to set the score, like you want to set max score, right? So you can set key name value and then you can get using key name value like for example if if let's say you get a high score okay at the beginning here you can then do this player press dot set in high score and you can put your score here now we can also have a high score variable over here which i, I haven't taught you how to do it but you can do a player press dot set in here and then at the beginning over here at the start you can do this player press dot get in score or high score. And then uh, if let's say there's no such thing called high score, it can be default initialized to be zero. So um, this is something uh, if you want to have a high score and you don't want it to be overwritten, whenever like you restart the game, you can use player press, right? player preferences to store this number so that you, you won't get lost. So for more information, you can look at player press. It is quite cool actually, because at different locations, 
or like Mac OS, phones, WebGL is stored differently. And then Unity will basically just store it at the right location for you so that you can save this externally. And then when you like start the game again, you won't like reload this. It's very important like for like RPG games, you do like 20% uh, of the game, you save the game. You can save the game in a player prefs, a string that contains the whole data for the game itself. So you can load it again next time when you load it. Okay, uh, dot, 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 is that clear? So you use player prefs, okay, to get this, okay? All right, I'm just gonna delete this because I didn't really teach this. Okay, uh, anything else? <laughs> okay, uh, I guess if there's nothing else, I hand the time back to Chaitanya. Okay, yeah, thanks so much, John. I think it was very good. I, th I think the game was pretty nice. Uh, and thanks for conducting this workshop. Uh, thanks everyone else for sticking for a little while more. I'm sure you got to learn a lot, but let me just share my screen. Um, if, I mean, if you were lost at some point or if you could not uh, catch up till the end, uh, I'll be sending an email. Once the recording is up, I'll be sending an email with the recording link with the feedback form, as well as uh, with John's own Twitch recording so you can uh, take a look at it in your own time and uh, finish the game if you want but yeah anyway thanks thanks for joining again uh please 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 fill the feedback form uh if possible because it'll help us improve the next iterations of the workshop uh yeah we we really take our feedback very seriously so if you can i think uh, it'll be great if you can fill the feedback but yeah uh we have three more workshops lined up over the next three days feel free to join uh remember to rsvp on the dashboard um, yeah, I'll leave this slide up for five minutes and then I'll be ending the call. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you, John. Thanks again. Uh, if you want me to communicate anything else to the participants in the post workshop email, just let me know. Uh, yeah, uh, but no, it's fine. Yeah, but yeah. if you are interested to like learn more about game dev stuff, I'll be conducting more advanced workshops at uh, NUS GDG where okay. we will cover like animations. Right. uh dungeon crawler stop down shooters that kind of thing if you're interested to create that yeah okay. you're welcome to join us but uh, i give you a sampling of like basic game creation for today i hope it has been fun Ooh. yeah uh, uh so who asked we don't need to join the so he has a question about gdg i think yeah oh actually you do need to join the cc because uh, we have a discord group that uh usually we will update our announcements there yeah, but, but really no commitment needed. I mean, you can just join the sessions if you want. Uh, the links for the, the GDG, if you're interested to join, uh, I think it will be on the video because I have one slide on it. You can just uh, join our Discord there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but if you join the Discord, but not in the CCA, you won't get the announcements. You need to be a verified uh, member of the Discord. Yeah. Uh, if if you want me to send the send any particular link to people to sign up for GDG, feel free to let me know. Okay. Oh yeah, maybe I I give you the details later for so sounds they good. can come out in the post workshop. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'll I'll leave this up for two more minutes. Then I'll be ending the call. Yeah. Yeah, but if you fill the feedback form, if you don't have any more questions, feel free to leave the meeting. Everyone, thanks again for joining. Yeah. Uh, uh, yep. John, I will send you a link of the recording once it's up, as well as ask you for any feedback if you have uh, at the end. Uh, I think the recording will take two to three hours to upload on YouTube. Yeah. So just give me a while. Yeah. I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, for following well, uh, and also uh, thank those people who have downloaded Unity before that, okay, so that uh, we can step through step by step. 
yeah, I, I do think a very important part of a uh, game development is actually trying it out and doing it yourself. Like for me, I, I've been practicing again and again various games. So it has helped to like strengthen the, the knowledge. So as with anything, it's really about practice. So yeah, hopefully if you find this interesting, you can practice more and not just play games, but code them yourself as well. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks so much for the opportunity, uh, Chaitanya, for... No worries. Thanks so much for conducting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Works both ways. Yep. Yeah. All right. I think I'll be ending the call now. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll be sending the post workshop email with more details. Okay. Bye bye. Yeah. See you at Hack and Roll. Bye bye, everyone.